Coming out this afternoon for what we can all see is a much anticipated lecture by Professor Sean Frayne. I've been asked to speak a bit by way of introduction. My w name is Bruce Chilton. I am Bernard Iddings Bell, Professor of Religion at Bard College and Executive Director of the Institute of Advanced Theology and the Center for the Study of James, the brother. What is the occasion for bringing a distinguished lecturer here? It is that for a number of years, we have been convening a group of scholars in order to investigate the historical importance of the figure called James, the brother of Jesus. The impetus for this work came from Mr. Frank Crone, who I'm very happy to say is with us this afternoon. And I would like to begin with a word of congratulation to Frank for getting us going in this study and also for initiating this important new center. Mr. Crone, thank you very much. At the outset, we weren't a center. At the outset, we were a consultation. That is, a group of scholars who sifted through the primary evidence concerning James, its implications for research, and some possibilities for further study. That resulted in three different volumes, which are now available. But as we brought that work together, it also became plain that there was something rather more interesting to be done, that it might be possible for us to build on the foundation of research and to see if there weren't new dimensions of knowledge which could be developed by concentrating upon the figure of James. At the same time, we saw as a result of our experience that James represents a unique opportunity for us to understand the relationship between Judaism and Christianity in antiquity, and therefore make that relationship more healthy in the modern period. Reasons for that, I think, are going to become plain as we hear Professor Frame today. Because we are now a center with our inaugural lecture and not any longer a consultation, we are speaking already to more people today, and we are also going about our task somewhat differently. Uh, this presentation is being webcast today. Someday, someone's going to explain to me what that means. <laughs> In addition to that, the lecture is being taped. That I do understand. As usual, the taping is being put together by Father Fred Cartier, and he'll be making that available to us as well. And we have plans also to publish this lecture in its written form and to make it more widely available. Because we have more people here and because there are more electronic gadgets involved, uh, we are distributing cards today for people to write their questions down, and then they'll be passed forward to me, and I'll pose them to Professor Frayne after his lecture has been completed. That way, I can also mix them in with questions that come by means of the internet, always supposing I can remember which buttons I am supposed to push. I'll let you know how that goes later on. When the proposal for the center and for a inaugural lecture was voiced by Mr. Crone, he asked my advice concerning who the best person would be for this role. And my mind immediately went to Professor Sean Frayne, who was at that time professor and chair of theology at Trinity College in Dublin, and whom I had known for some years and whose work I had known even longer than that. He is a scholar who has specialized in the study of the New Testament in its own language, with careful attention to its literary style. And he has broken fresh ground 
in the relationship between the historical study of Jesus and Christian origins with archaeology. I know of no single figure within the discipline who has done more to make that a productive conversation than Professor Frame. As a result of that, he has also shaped the way we presently view the historical figure of Jesus. When I first arrived at Bard College 20 years ago, I could find not only students, but also faculty, faculty who thought that Jesus would have spoken Greek as well as Aramaic, that he probably preferred to wear a toga rather than a tunic, and if asked to cite some intellectual, he might go for Plato before he went to Isaiah. The number of people who think those thoughts has much reduced over the past 20 years, largely because scholars have stopped saying those things. And Professor Frayn has taught our colleagues the limits of their wishful thinking when it comes to studying the historical Jesus. The reason for which I think he has been such a formative force within the field is that he combines his considerable acumen with humor and always with a steady humanist's eye for the importance of language and for the place of language in shaping human belief. If some of you are looking for a place to begin in studying the works of Professor Frayn, I would cite his work, Jesus, a Jewish Galilean. Someone who has made so much progress in the study of Jesus certainly is the obvious choice for figuring out his brother, Professor Frame. Well, good evening, everybody. After that introduction, I fear um, <coughs> I'm going to bound to disappoint you all, but I'll do my best anyhow. Uh, <coughs> the... Um, it's a great pl pleasure and great honour for me to come to this part of the world. I hadn't realised just how beautiful it was. Everybody told me that fall in this part of the world was gorgeous, and it certainly is. And I've enjoyed my visit very much, and thank Bruce in particular, but also all the other people who have made my, my stay here and my visit to Eve and uh, Emily and others. Uh, so, such a pleasant one, and thank you, Frank, also for making this possible. Uh, Bruce has already said that I spend my time working on, on the Jesus uh, and uh, that I should be able to figure out his uh, brother as well. But mind you, brothers differ, don't they? <laughs> so, so I'm not quite sure. We'll try anyhow and see what... This is a, an attempt on my part to, to enter in a field that in many ways I feel somewhat of a, a beginner because when I did be, uh, begin to look at the literature on the field, I began to realise that Bruce Chilton's name was appearing all over the place plus also uh, Jacob Neusner's work. So it, it began to, it, it sounded a little bit like bringing Coles to Newcastle to come here as a novice, so to speak, in the field and talk about James. But then I suppose they do get tired talking to each other, so maybe an, an extra, <laughs> another voice is not, not, not unimportant in this discussion. Now, I've entitled my paper Retrieving James Yakov. And I put the word Yakov in deliberately because I think the word James, the name James, already kind of confuses a little and perhaps we missed the point that uh, the very name uh, Yaakov, of course, recalls one of the, the great patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the father of the, the, uh, uh, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I, I would want to take it and hope to take it that uh, James, the brother of the Lord, uh, understood that connection and those associations with his own name. So I think it was important just to remind ourselves, all of us, including myself, that that was the, that was the association. And I titled it From Legend to History. Now, I have given a handout, and unfortunately, I think, Bruce, you may have possibly taken my, my, my sheets with you there. <laughs> uh, they were here earlier, but they've disappeared, so this is the one, yes. Uh, uh, the handout simply will, t will give you, the, the bold type will tell you, as it were, the moves I'm making in the lecture. And uh, the numberings uh, along the side will tell you the texts that I'm citing or talking about uh, as we move along. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer to these as I go, just so that you know where I, where I'm, uh, what I'm talking about, as it were, what texts I'm discussing. Uh, 
So let us begin with a statistic. James is mentioned just 11 times in the New Testament, whereas Peter, Peter's name occurs on 190 different occasions. This statistic should alert us immediately to the fact that there was a problem about James in earliest Christianity, particularly in view of the considerable body of evidence about his role in later Christian writings, as we'll be seeing later. <coughs> to put the matter bluntly, James was not wholly written out of the official script of, script of Christian origins because those responsible, for example Luke, could not have done so and remain credible. In fact, behind these 11 references, there's a hidden or largely submerged other script. And in this paper, I would like to share with you my efforts to uncover that script, attempting to fill in the lacunae, and there are many, uh, when the script has become frayed at the edges, or even worse still, broken into fragments. In my discussion, I have opted uh, not, to, not to search for scraps of information in the later material dealing with James, uh, often the way the scholars move uh, from the... the the better known to the less known, uh, scraps that might or might not fill in the gaps of the first century evidence. Instead, it seems better to try to trace the legend of James as this emerges in all branches of developing, Juda uh, developing Christianity. What are the trajectories, commonalities and distinctive features that emerge from such a survey? A cluster of related uh, issues uh, repeatedly surface. One of these is the question of the death of James which immediately points to the issue of his relationship with other branches of Judaism. Another topic is his leadership role within, his, within earliest Christianity, in particular his relationship with Peter and Paul. Thus the argument will be developed in two stages, and they're set out in the large type in your page. Uh, I begin firstly at looking at what I call the James legends, or perhaps the James legend would do in the singular, uh, of later centuries. These will be examined in order to highlight the varying perspectives of different interest groups within earliest Christianity. Secondly, I will attempt to reconstruct the history behind the legends, guided by the themes uncovered in this first part of the analysis. We cannot, of course, uh, rule out the possibility that the legendarization of James had begun in the first generation already, in order to address various situations that had arisen in that phase of the new movement. One way to negotiate this problem is to suggest a contextually plausible setting from among the competing Judaisms of the first century something that Professor Neusner has taught me uh, to think about very seriously over the years. Within this, uh, within this spectrum, it should be possible to situate the emerging picture of James and ev evaluate its reliability. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So then the first main part of my paper of this brief introduction is exploring the James legends. It can be fun to enter the weird and wonderful world of legends and legend makers, but it can also be a hazardous business if one does not know and respect the rules of the game. Legends are rarely produced just for entertainment purposes, but usually serve some other purpose or respond to some need. Community legends are flights of the collective imagination, but also in many cases exercise of collective memory, as a group reaches into its past for enlightenment, encouragement and legitimization. Legends are at the myth-making rather than the historic end of a narrative continuum, with history perhaps in the middle somewhere. And yet I would argue that it can be used judiciously, of course, to explore the past as well as the present of their subjects. So in this respect, the James legends prove to be a most interesting topic for investigation. And so I come now to the first main topic, as I say, that I find in the legends about James, James uh, the Martyr, but I've entitled it here, rather provocatively, in the title of an essay I come across, James was Jewish, not Christian. Perhaps the single most significant aspect of, J of the James of later writings is the consistency with which the designation, the just one, is applied to him. Indeed, so ubiqui ubiquitous is this usage that in time it became in identified with his person in a manner not dissimilar to the way in which the designation the anointed one or the Christ became part of the name of his brother Jesus. In both instances, each is deemed to have fulfilled our mission in such a way that personal name and role can be conflated. Eusebius, the fourth century Christian historian, in introducing James in, in, into his narrative says, the men of old had given him the surname the just because of his virtue. In the Gospel of Thomas, the Saviour himself designates him as James the Just. And in some, some other writings, even James' accusers and opponents address him directly as, O Just One. 
implying that this was the way in which he was known and revered. The designation Sadiq, or Dikaios, the just one, had acquired quasi-messianic quasi status already in the Hebrew Bible, in Isaiah and Jeremiah also. And it continued to, to be used in, in the context of end-time ideal ruler in later Jewish writings, where it is often associated with the gift of divine wisdom. For example, the Psalms of Solomon or one Enoch. In Hegesippus' portrayal, portrayal of a second century Christian writer that Eusebius preserves for us, in his portrayal, in addition to being described as the just one, James was also said to be the holy one, the Hagias, from his mother, to be holy, Hagias, from his mother's womb. Uh, so this same combination of the just one and the holy one is found in the early proclamation about Jesus. Peter, for example, charges the Jerusalem crowd in Acts of the Apostles of rejecting the holy and righteous one, the holy and just one, asking instead for a murderer. Uh, that is this, uh, an allusion to the story of the Barabbas incident in the trial stories. Thus the association of James' status with that of Jesus, as this was articulated in the early Christian charisma, is a significant step in the developing legend about him. In addition to this messianic association of the ideal ruler as the Sadiq or just one, the designation also had redemptive uh, connotations with the biblical Noah as the prototype. According to the book of Genesis, in a world full of evil, Noah is said to be a righteous man and perfect in his generation and thus to have walked with God. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. It is for this reason that he was chosen to save the whole of God's creation, the animal and human alike, by arranging for the ark. This theme reappears in rabbinic literature. The presence of one just man ensured that the world was created and likewise that it was saved. An, an aspect that is clearly echoed in the Gospel of Thomas, saying already alluded to, Jesus is reputed to have said, Go to James the just, for whom heaven and earth came into being. Thus, the ascetic lifestyle of the Sadiq can avert disaster. A later rabbinic anecdote uh, uh, is highly pertinent in view of the linking of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 with the murder of James in some Christian writings. As the emaciated Rabbi Sadok, who had fasted for 40 years in order to save Jerusalem, uh, was being led out from the, uh, the burning city, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zachai, the leader of the post-70 Jamni re renewal, confronted the mocking Roman general Vespasian and declared, if there had been another uh, such as this one, you would not have been able to destroy Jerusalem even if you had an army twice as large. It is to Josephus that we owe our earliest account of James's death, his antiquities. However, the incident merely served the author's purpose to illustrate a large, larger theme in his Jewish antiquities written in Rome in the early 90s, uh, namely Josephus' own pro pharisaic and anti sadducean stance in the antiquities. And Ennis II, the high priest, he tells us, who had, J had James and some others arraigned, condemned and stoned during the interregnum of the Roman governorship of Judea in 62 of the Common Era. He was a member of the Sadducee party and is described by Josephus as being, quote, bold in temperament and exceedingly daring. This, this by the way, is the first text on your handout, the martyrdom of James, number one. <clears throat> uh, bold in temperament and exceedingly daring. While the newly appointed governor Albinus was on his way, Ananus uh, summoned a court of judges and had James and the others convicted on this unspecified charge of breaking the law. However, others whom Josephus describes as, quote, the, good, the most reasonable in the city and accurate interpreters of the law, probably a code word for the Pharisees, complained to Albinus uh, about the matter and had Ananus deposed. This incident was clearly important in early Christian polemics with the Jews. Eusebius, the 4th century historian, as I mentioned already, reports Josephus' account in full, but prefaces it by attributing the following statement also to him, I have that also in, that under number one in your handout. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the following statement to him. These things, namely the siege of Jerusalem, happened to the Jews to avenge James the Just, who was the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, for the Jews killed him because of his great righteousness. This statement is not in any manuscript of Josephus' Jewish antiquities, but it reflects what the second century writer Hegesippus had reported in his lengthy account of the incident, which comes as number three in your handout. <coughs> uh, uh, Eusebius has also included this in his, in his uh, ecclesiastical history. After James's death, Hegesippus reports, immediately Vespasian began to besiege them. Eusebius endorses this statement, going, on, going so far as to declare that even the wise among the Jews thought that this was the cause of the siege of Jerusalem immediately after James's martyrdom. 
Hegesippus' uh, account differs considerably from that of Josephus. The most significant divergences are the absence of any mention of either Albinus, the Roman governor, or Ananus, the high priest. And James' accusers are now the scribes and Pharisees. After showing initial respect for James and recognition of his influence, they are envious of his, of his success with the people in proclaiming Jesus as the Son of Man, seated on the right hand of the great power, who will come in the clouds of heaven. Accordingly, they had James thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple and stoned. Thus, from a passing reference to James, James and some others being unlawfully put to death by Ananus, the story of James's death has been transformed in less than a century into a full-blown account of a martyrdom. What is important about this development is, as Daniel Boyarin has reminded us, with regard to all stories of martyrdom, not so much the circumstances surrounding the death as the fact that it gave rise to a powerful discourse that was to influence and shape subsequent Christian and Jewish history in significant ways. In Hegesippus' highly dramatic account, the opponents addressed James ironically. Quote, For we and all the people bear witness, the Greek word martyrumen, we bear witness that you are righteous, dikaios, and do not respect persons. James, on the other hand, bears the true witness with his life, and his actual death is described in classical martyrological language, thus he bore witness, hutos emarturesen, the same verb, we bear witness, and now he, he becomes a martyr. In describing James' death, Hegesippus draws on some motifs taken from the Passion narrative in the Gospels, as well as from the account of Stephen's death in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. James is meant to rep replicate the witness of Jesus. Though separated in life, James and Jesus became identified in death, thereby completing the process begun already with the shared nomenclature, the just one and the holy one. This colouring of the account in terms of the developing ideology of Christian martyrdom, albeit in James's case at the hands of Jewish rather than Roman opponents, merely highlights the strong Jewish features in the description of James al also. The statement that he, that he was holy, hagios from his mother's, uh, mother's womb, prepares for the priestly role that is assigned to him. His ascetic lifestyle is couched in terms of the Nazarite vow. James neither drank wine nor strong drink and did not shave himself in accordance with the regulations for this uh, procedure, as set out in the book of Numbers, chapter 6. The implication is that James remained a Nazir all his life and also abstained from meat and avoided aspects of the Greek way of life, such as anointing his body with oil and visiting the baths. This elaborate description of his ascetic lifestyle prepares for the extraordinary claim that James alone was allowed to enter the holy place, the Ta Hagia, the holy place. In fact, the Latin version of this uh, says the holy of holies, <coughs> of this text uh, from, uh, from Hegesippus. Since he wore the linen, so, quote, since he wore linen, not wool. The allusion here is to the description of the high priest's clothing on the, the one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, when only he could enter the Holy of Holies to make atonement, to make atonement by sprinkling the blood uh, for his own and the people's sins. Leviticus chapter 16. Interestingly, however, James does not offer sacrifice or sprinkle blood. Instead, he prayed daily in the temple. This time it's the word naos, the outside temple, rather than the Hagia, the holy place, asking for forgiveness for the sins of the people. The implications of this account are that James was deemed to have acted in a high priestly role because of his outstanding holiness. In this he stood in stark contrast to the high priest Ananus uh, for those who, like Eusebius, knew Josephus' account uh, also. The fact that James engaged in prayer for the people rather than sacrifice recalls Jesus' use of Isaiah 56.5 5 in Mark's account of the so-called cleansing of the temple. Jesus is meant to say, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. This apparent anti-cultic anti theme, already expressed by Isaiah and other prophets and reiterated by the Mark and Jesus, was carried further by one branch of the fractured, fractured Jewish Christian family, according to the Gospel of the Ebionites, a fragment of which is, has been preserved for us in, 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 a, in a later writing. Jesus is meant to declare, I have come to abolish sacrifice, and if you do not cease to offer sacrifice, the wrath of God will not cease from you. In Epiphanius, his account. Thus, Hegesippus' account of James's behaviour, so graphically described by the remark that his knees were like those of a camel because his praying was so constant, I wish mine were so, it, it is in line with this Jewish Christian critique of sacrifice, and possibly also James's own vegetarian lifestyle, while still maintaining the centrality of the actual temple and its symbolism. In this developing portrait of James within a Jewish perspective, there is no mention of disputes with Paul over the law or terms of it for admission of the Gentiles. 
despite the prominence of these themes in the New Testament. The issue of James's observance was not in question, pointing to the, fa to the fact that in the period in which these legends were taking shape, in the 2nd to the 4th centuries of the Common Era, the Jewish-Christian question now centred round the identity of Jesus. In the context of 2nd century inner Jewish polemics, the manner of James's death had made him closer to Jesus uh, than he had been in life. In these debates, the Jewish Christians who continued to observe circumcision, the dietary and Sabbath laws, but believed in Jesus as the Messiah or the expected prophet like Moses, found themselves in a very difficult position. On the one hand, a hand fellow, fellow Jews regarded them as minim or heretics, and fellow believers in Christ in the increasingly Gentile church rejected them as not acknowledging the futility of the law for salvation. The Jewish Christians who had fled Jerusalem after the death of James, our leader, which Eusebius also tells us about, never returned to the city insofar as we can tell. They continued their in-between existence in Transjordan, but probably also, possibly also in Galilee. Opinions differ concerning the uh, strands that appear in our later sources. Epiphanius claims that the Nazarene sect represented orthodox position, whereas the Ebionites the heretical. Uh, their leader's death, not that of Jesus, was the cause of the destruction of Jerusalem, they believed. And this gave them the impetus to develop the legend of James's martyrdom, which we've just been examining, and which uh, would be developed further in, uh, in the Christian Gnostic writings related to James, as well as another uh, collection of writings, the Pseudo-Clementine Corpus. Perhaps this linking of James with the actual temple arises from the importance of a public place as the appropriate site for a martyrdom in all early Christian accounts of martyrdom. It should happen in the public place. Yet their memory of the temple was surely also grounded in their continued observance of elements of Jew Jewish ritual and dietary laws. Hegesippus' description of James as performing the function of the high priest in the Day of Atonement, while being open to a deliberately ironic interpretation of mimicking, as it were, Judaism, con it contrasts sharply with that of the canonical Epistle to the Hebrews, which designates the temple rituals as being old and outdated. Christ, the eternal high priest, entered once for all the heavenly sanctuary to make atonement for sins through the sacrifice of himself and not with the blood of goats and heifers, according to Hebrews chapter 9, 11 to 28. This is a kind of supersessionist uh, idea of the atonement in a Pauline rather than a Jamesian inspiration, it seems to me, despite the name of the letter, the letter to the Hebrews, which one might have thought would have been a, a Jewish Christian letter. It seems to me to be much more in the Pauline tradition of Jesus fulfilling the law and bringing an end to the law, as it were. <clears throat> Others within the broad church of the post-70 groups who mourn the temple would develop different interpretive strategies to deal with its loss. Prophecies of a new temple in the Hebrew Bible and such later writings of one Enoch or the temple scroll from Qumran provided the basis for the more apocalyptically minded groups, including various Christian groups, to hope for a new Jerusalem and a new temple. According to, de to the developing teaching of the post-70 sages, the holiness that the temple represented at the heart of Israel could be achieved now in the home and the village by careful attention to the legal requirements regarding the temple, its feasts and its offerings, as Professor Neusner has so lucidly set out for us in his book, Judaism, the Evidence of the Mishnah. Still others, perhaps the remnants of the priestly class, remembered the temple in artistic representations that adorned some of their synagogues, a Dura Europus, Sepphoris, Beth Alpha, Baram, and elsewhere, after the, especially after the Emperor Julian's abortive attempt to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem in the mid-fourth century of the Common Era. So that's my first theme, as it were, and looking at the way the legend develops from a, an account just of a death, an unjust death perhaps, in Josephus, to the developing legend of James the Martyr, and the way in which uh, James' holiness is, is, as it were, developed as part of that whole scenario. And the linking of him closely, therefore, with the role of the priest, uh, the high priest, uh, making atonement for the sins, sins of the people, but also then his death, the cause of the destruction of Jerusalem. A second theme is the, the James legend and inner Christian leadership struggles. Here we go to the set of writing on page two, I think, uh, on the handout, yes, James's authority. <coughs> I begin with this citation from, uh, the, the, uh, uh, from Paul, an early letter of Paul, 1 Corinthians, when Paul mentions the list of appearances of the risen that he had received on his entry into the new movement, he, he mentions Peter and the Twelve and James and the 500 brethren. When he mentions these two different leaders, as it were, in their groups, their respective groups, he may already be hinting at two different, if not opposing, groups and, uh, and their leaders being already in existence. Paul himself was soon to enter the fray, asserting his rights to be considered an apostle also, 
even though he had not been a follower of the earthly Jesus, and neither had James. Yet these three authoritative figures, James, Peter and Paul from the, uh, from the earliest days, but also John, became rallying figures around whom different strands of opinion were crystallising by the end of the first century in early Christianity. Nowadays, categories such as heretical and orthodox are seen to be both premature and un unhelpful in defining these strands, since the boundaries between them were and, were and continue to be fluid for several centuries. Clearly, in such a situation, the source of authority was vital, and the pattern of authorization by the risen Lord became the touchstone. We can see, uh, see this same process continued among the Gnosticizing Christians, uh, groups in the Gospels now attributed to Thomas, Mary, Judas, uh, and are, uh, who are all represented as receiving special instruction and authorization from the Saviour in the post-resurrection period. The process of James's authentication continued to be developed by his Jewish Christian followers, probably expedited by his martyrdom. In a fragment preserved by Jerem, the early Christian writer, from the Gospel of the Hebrews, we read that James participated in the Last Supper. This is reading 2.2 two on, your, on your Jewish Christian, uh, head, under the heading Jewish Christian in your handout. Uh, we read that James participated in the Last Supper, and after drinking from the cup of the Lord, he took an oath not to eat or drink again until he had seen Jesus risen from the dead. Soon afterwards, Jesus appeared to James alone and freed him from his oath, declaring that the Son of Man was indeed risen. Thus, James is designated the primary witness and the most authoritative figure, according to this fragment from a Jewish Christian gospel. The pseudo-Clementine writings, as I mentioned already, are generally recognised to be a composite collection dated to the 4th century, though probably based on an earlier 3rd century work, now lost. That they contain important sources dealing with the Jewish Christians of earlier centuries is generally accepted. In particular, pseudo-Clementine's recognitions 1, uh, 27 to 71, has been identified as being closely related to a work mentioned by Epiphanius, entitled the Greek, in Greek, the Anabathma Jacobu, the Ascents of James. It is reported that after Peter and each member of the Twelve had disputed with the Jewish authorities over several days in the temple precincts, the climax, climax comes with the confrontation on an appointed day between James and the Jewish authorities. The discussion centres on an argument from the scriptures about the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, and James expounded the law and the prophets for seven days to the point that the high priest and the people were prepared to be baptised. However, a certain hostile man, quote unquote, intervened to stir up a riot, and actually threw James from the parapet of the temple, this echoing the account of his martyrdom in, in, in Hegesippus, leaving him for dead. James was rescued and eventually taken out of the city by night to Jericho, where word reached the disciples that the hostile man had got permission from Caiaphas to persecute believers in Jesus, travelling as far as Damascus. The reference to Damascus uh, gives it away, I think, the identity of this wicked man to be Paul. Uh, based on the story in Acts of the Apostles about his persecution of Christians prior to his conversion. While this exaltation of James in the Jewish Christian literature is to be expected, it is somewhat surprising to find the same trend carried on in the Christian Gnosticizing circles also. As already mentioned, saying 12 in the, of the Gospel of Thomas is an answer to a request from the disciples as to whom they should, should approach after he had departed. To which Jesus replies, The place to which you come, you shall go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. So James is there designated once again, the most authoritative figure to interpret the sayings of the master. Three other documents from the same circle, the Coptic versions of which were found in Nag Hammadi in 1947, developed this portrait of James as a recipient of special revelation uh, somewhat further. The now familiar themes of his martyrdom, the epithet the just, and James's principal role among the apostles as teacher in Jerusalem because of his closeness to Christ are all alluded to in various ways in these writings. Uh, <clears throat> in, one, in the first uh, Apocalypse of James, uh, which fills, um, uh, we have a new, new version of this now, has been just uh, published actually, uh, just very recently, it was discovered in a, a new codex in which the Gospel of Judas was also found. And in this particular new version of, of the document, we have a much better account of the martyrdom of James. The Saviour meets with James privately before his own death and prepares James for what is to, about to happen. Uh, afterwards, he meets James again as he was performing his duties on the mountain, as it's put, praying and instructing his disciples. I've given you this text here on uh, number four on the Gnostic Christians. And the handout. <clears throat> James embraces him and kisses him and tells of his distress on hearing of the Saviour's passion. 
but is now instructed about his own martyrdom that is to come, which is necessary for the soul to ascend to the one who is. Thus James' spiritual union with the Saviour is assured. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this, at the reception of James in the way, in the, is the way in which the developing great church accommodated him within its structures. Here I'm operating with kind of three different strands, very loosely described, it has to be said, between Jewish Christianity, namely James' own followers, then what I call uh, the uh, Gnosticizing Christians, Christians who seem to have been in touch with Gnostic circles, and the third one, what I call the Orthodox, a great church that would have developed later. So three different recognisable strands already, but at this point I, we're not using the terms Orthodox or her heretical for them. But it's interesting to see the way in which this, this reception of James, in, in the way in which the developing of the great church accommodated him within its structures. The fact that Eusebius, the official, official historian of the Constantinian reconciliation of church and empire, included Hegesippus' version of James's martyrdom, deeming it to... The, deeming it to be the most reliable, despite his strong Jewish-Christian colouring, as we've seen, shows that there was, there was no concerted effort, by Eusebius at least, to write him out of the history of the Church. Yet it is clear that Eusebius wants to incorporate James into the monarchical episcopacy of his own time. Already in the second century, these tensions had emerged and Clement of Alexandria had sought to smooth things out, with his statement, quote, that Peter and James and John, after the ascension of the Saviour, did not struggle for glory because they had previously been honoured by the Saviour, but chose James the Just as Bishop of Jerusalem. That's reading uh, 6 on your handout. <clears throat> the Great Church, number 6. Eusebius had introduced a citation from Clement with his own summary of the matter. James is narrated to have been the first elected to the throne of the bishopric of the church in Jerusalem. Thus, it seems to me, anachronistically imposing the trappings of episcopacy from his own time onto the earlier period of the church. Indeed, the apostolic throne of James becomes a, an important symbol of continuity from the beginning for Eusebius, who notes that it was greatly re reverenced in Jerusalem, quote, to this very day. <clears throat> Uh, at the same time, Eusebius can be ambivalent, declaring uh, once, for example, that James, James uh, received the episcopate of Jerusalem from the Saviour and, and the Apostles, thereby combining the source of James's independence, namely uh, vision from the Saviour, which we saw in the Gospel of the Hebrews, and superiority as, as propagated by the Jewish Christians, with his own version of James taking his place within the apostolic chain of episcopal succession. What does emerge clearly in the ecclesiastical history is the fact that Eusebius wishes to restrict James' sphere of influence to one place only, namely Jerusalem. He is the first in a line of bishops within that church, all of them Hebrews up to the time of Hadrian's siege, 135, just as Peter was the first in Antioch and later in Rome, Mark in Alexandria, Dionysus in Athens and Timothy in Ephesus. So there's a founder figure to each and he has a list of, of bishops to each for each local church. This domestica domestication of James uh, uh, is completed by the late acceptance of the epistle of James into the canon, even though it was addressed to the twelve tribes of the dispersion. This at least implies that James, or whoever wrote in his name, had claimed a wider authority than just that of the Jerusalem church, whether all, whether all Christian believers or only Jewish Christian ad addressees are intended. The twelve tribes of the dispersion probably sounds like Jewish Christians to me. This restriction of James within the framework of the apostolic succession and the monarchic, monarchic episcopate of the great church contrasts sharply with his profile in, in the Jewish Christian writings. Already Hegesippus had suggested that James had become a true witness to Jews and Greeks, thus suggesting he had a wider mission than just in Jerusalem. This profile was further enhanced by the ascents of James as represented in the Suda Clementines, where he is said to have interrogated each of the twelve separately as to what they had done in each place in front of the whole assembly of the Jerusalem church in a formal session. James is depicted as exercising a supervisory role over the twelve, therefore, in that work. So once again, I've tried to trace, if you like, the legend of James's authority and his special place in the church. And you can see that immediately, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Paul, but also in regard to Peter, that he has a primacy role over either Peter or Paul. In, in, these, in these different developing legends in all three strands. So now I'll move to the second part of my work, uh, of my paper, namely from legend to history. Each of the different broad strands that can be identified within Christianity up to the fourth century of the Common Era have interpreted the role of James in light of their own overall perspectives. The Jewish Christians, uh, the Gnosticizing Christians, and the emerging Great Church. <coughs> 
Yet a number of constants lie behind all these interpretations, namely that James the Just, the brother of the Lord, was deeply associated with Jerusalem and its temple, that he had an important leadership role within earliest Christianity, and that he was murdered by the Jerusalem high priest for an unspecified crime of breaking the law. The task now before us is to explore whether or not these discrete pieces of information, or at least developing legend, correspond with the picture which emerges from the, a critical examination of the New Testament evidence. And should this be the case, can they be put into a pl plausible account of James's life within the broader framework of the competing Jew Jewish factions operating within pre-revolt pre uh, Jerusalem? Why should a group of Jesus followers, under the leadership of somebody who had not, insofar as we can tell, been a member of the permanent retinue during Jesus' life, decide to gather in Jerusalem in his name so soon after his violent death? That's the question. Why would they gather in Jerusalem? By the time Paul makes his first visit to Jerusalem, which is, and his own admission took place three years after his Damascus Road experience, James the brother of the Lord, that is not James the son of Zebedee, with whom he can sometimes be confused, who was number the 12, uh, was an influential person with whom Paul felt it necessary to consult formally. In attempting to provide a suitable frame of answering uh, our own question, it is necessary uh, to remind ourselves of the centrality of Jerusalem for all messianic claimants are reforming prophets, including Jesus. Despite the efforts of some recent scholars to, who de to describe his movement, Jesus' movement as Galilean-based and anti-Jerusalem. What has been described as the mythopoiesis of Zion? that is the mythicization of, of Zion, can be traced back to the Babylonian exile at least. And here I give you a number of readings from the book of Isaiah uh, on, on your handout, from legend to history, numbers, the, servant, the servants of Zion, under that subheading one to, uh, one to, to seven, citation from Isaiah. I say this uh, mythicization of Zion can be traced back to the Babylonian exile at least even when very different understandings of how the myth should function were expressed uh, over the centuries. One can see the beginnings of a bifurcation from an early stage, especially as this is articulated in the latter part of the Book of Isaiah, usually dated to the Persian period, when the exuberance of return gives way to the sober realities of picking up the pieces in the tiny province of Yehud under Persian rule. Alongside the notion of a triumphant Zion, whose children shall be brought back from exile by the nations in pomp and splendor, uh, an, another notion of Zion begins to crystallize around a mysterious figure called the Ebed, or Servant of Yahweh, whose mission is seen as twofold, to restore the tribes of Jacob, Yaakov, and to bring light to the nations, who are de deemed to be waiting for the enlightenment of the, that the Torah brings. The prophet's servant becoming, becomes a suffering servant, as the story develops, however, as his unrecognizable plight is described by a group who describe themselves in, in the text as we, and who acknowledge their arrogant behaviour and their judgement of this enigmatic figure. Yet, as a reward for his patient acceptance and humble bearing, the suffering servant is assured of Yahweh's vindication. He shall be exalted and shall be, see his offspring, literally his seed, flourish and prosper, Isaiah 53. Clearly a biblically charged reference to followers who will successfully carry on his mission. As the book of Isaiah comes to a close, a group calling themselves the servants, plural of Yahweh, emerge along the, alongside the triumphalists. They, like their patron and progenitor, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, suffer at the hands of the dominant group, who pride themselves as recipients of God's favour, control the temple and its worship, but engage in all kinds of syncretistic pract practices and a luxurious lifestyle. The servants, however, are the ones that Yahweh will favour. My servants will, will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will exult in gladness, but you will cry out for sadness. Isaiah 65, 13 and 14, number five of the readings I've given you from Isaiah. A voice from the temple thunders, judgment against those who have, uh, judgment against those who have ostracized and persecuted his servants. And ominously, God declares that he does not require a temple, since the heavens are his throne and the earth his footstool, Isaiah 66, 1 and 6. Those Jewish Christians who had linked the destruction of the Jerusalem temple with the death of James had, in fact, good biblical warrant, it would seem. Many New Testament scholars discussed the possible influence of Isaiah 53 in early Christianity, including Professor Chilton. And because there is no clear direct citation, I don't include 
those are children in this little observation, by the way, they decide that they played little or no part in the Jesus group's self-understanding. This is to ignore the larger structural and thematic links, not to speak of verbal echoes, that become obvious when one looks at the picture in Isaiah. Uh, at, an, at another crucial juncture in Judean history later, when the Jerusalem temple had been des desecrated by Antiochus IV Epiphanes in the mid-2nd century, this picture of the servant community of Zion provided the inspiration for the wise ones, the masculine of Daniel, to follow the example of the Zion servants of Yahweh, and do not, who do not engage in militant resistance to the imperial oppressor. They also provide a close analogue for both Jesus and his movement in adopting a non-violent stance while engaging in resistance to Roman imperial values as these were being espoused and practised in, in Palestine by the Herods and the Jewish aristocracy in, in the first century. At least that's the argument of my recent book that Professor Chilton alluded to. This, I suggest, is the answer to our question why the Jesus movement saw a presence in Jerusalem as being essential to its claims to, the messianic to be the messianic community of Israel's hopes for renewal. It was the genius of James to have perceived and understood this aspect of his brother's vision. It was also the reason for his prominence, or better, his dominance, in the earliest days of the new movement, even if, if that had been blurred by later developments. So that's my, as it were, locating James in a, in a larger context or framework. So let's explore a bit more now. We must still fill in the map, I'm suggesting, with the fragments of James's life previously identified, or at least uh, uh, noted, and see how well they might fit the scenario being proposed here. The fact is, uh, the fact that it is James, the brother of the Lord, and not one of the twelve, who becomes leader of the Jerusalem group of Jesus followers, is at first very puzzling. He is nowhere depicted as having a positive relationship with the earthly Jesus. Mark does list him as one of the four, brothers, four of Jesus' brothers on the occasion of, his, of a failed visit to, the, to Nazareth, Mark 6.3. Uh, as one of the brothers of the Lord, we must include him among those who, who, with his mother, sought to bring him home, declaring that he was out of his mind, Mark 3.20. An episode that clearly embarrassed both Matthew and Luke, since they drop it all together. In the fourth gospel, the brothers of the Lord show little understanding of the purpose of Jesus' signs, even though they were privy to the first of them at Cana probably drank too much wine, one that is said to have led to, to his disciples believing in him, but his, his brother's not. Luke, writing late in the, in the first or early in the second century, had a particular interest in presenting a unified picture of the early Christian movement, despite the signs of it splintering into different factions, which you've seen evidence of already. His picture of the family of Jesus and the Twelve gathered together in the upper room on the eve of Pentecost is highly idealised, as indeed are the other summaries of the new movement's activities in the early chapters of Acts of the Apostles. In his subsequent account of the early days of the community in Jerusalem, neither James nor any other member of the Brothers of the Lord had any part to play. Peter and John are his spokespersons. It is only after the other James, that is the son of Zebedee and member of the Twelve, was murdered and Peter imprisoned in the persecution launched by Herod Agrippa the First in the early 40s, that James, the brother of the Lord, enters Luke's narrative for the first time almost surreptitiously. Without any prior information within the narrative about his role, we are suddenly informed that Peter, as he's about to leave the city for, quote, another place, gives orders that James and the believers should be told of his departure. So it's as though Peter is operating in one place and James and the believers are somewhere else. Luke, in fact, never calls James the brother of the Lord. Now, does he mention him in, in, his, in his gospel, even omitting Mark's list of Jesus' brothers in Nazareth? It is only at the so-called Council of Jerusalem that James emerges from the shadows, as, as it is he who announces his decision in a highly formal fashion. I judge, crino, I judge, to the apostles, the elders, and the whole church. And his judgment was to write to the church in Antioch, asking them to respect Jewish sensibilities around food and marriage, but not insisting on, super, uh, on circumcision. Subsequently, he plays a similar role when Paul returns to Jerusalem with the collection for the local church in Acts chapter 21. This is reading number 9 and 10, these two readings from Luke, Luke's account in your handout. It's noteworthy, incidentally, that Paul does not stay with James on arrival in the city, but makes a formal visit to him the next day, and this time the elders only were present. Again, the decision is one of comp uh, compromise, namely that Paul should seek to ease the suspicions that had arisen with regard to his corrupting the, the Jews in the diaspora, and to this end, the suggestion was made that he should perform a public act of joining some young men in the temple, for making the, the le leverage vows, defraying their costs, and presumably also ensuring his own ritual cleanness after his sojourn among the, among the Gentiles. <coughs> 
In both these instances, Luke assumes that James was the head of a group of elders in charge of the Jerusalem church. While he is named separately, he's never, he nevertheless functions within a set of community uh, stru structures, uh, rather than on, a person, on his person, own personal authority, though that is also expressed. This curtails somewhat the position of James in a way that is not at all obvious in Paul's much earlier account of the situation in Jerusalem when he first visited. However, it conforms to Luke's attempt to suggest a unitary structure of authority in the church from the beginning. Like the other great historian of Christianity of four centuries later, Eusebius, Luke too is an apologist for the great church, and so he seeks to indicate that there was a direct line of succession from the beginning, even if the monarchic episcopate had not yet emerged as the preferred form of governance, and the pattern does not fully fit the facts that Luke was reporting. While Paul is most anxious in Galatians chapters 1 and 2 to defend his own independence as an apostle, he does feel the need to go to Jerusalem three years after his Damascus Road experience and was accepted by both Peter and James. On a second visit 14 years later, he again goes up there to meet with the pillar apostles, named as James, Peter and John, in that order this time. James comes first. He receives the hand of friendship from them in a private meeting, despite some problems created by false believers, secretly brought in. James now becomes first in the list of pillar apostles, whereas in the previous visit, Peter was named first. James clearly has some overseeing role for the conduct of the Gentile mission also, no matter how reluctant Paul was to admit this, since a little later in the chapter, we hear that certain men from James went to Antioch to monitor how the, the arrangements had been, that had been agreed to in Jerusalem were being observed. By then, Peter is in Antioch on his, on his mission to the circumcised, and later he must have gone on to Corinth because we hear about that in 1 Corinthians, thus leaving the stage free for James in Jerusalem. In order to appreciate James's middle position with regard to the terms of Gentiles' admission to the church, it is important to under understand, at, at the, at, on the one hand, the actual situation in Jerusalem during his period in charge, uh, and on the other hand, his convictions about the Gentiles' entitlement to salvation in his understanding of a restored Israel that, that he was heir to within the Jesus movement. Within, uh, within th that a version of restoration that the Asian servant community espoused, and which we have suggested provide the analogue for both Jesus and James, the nations were viewed as longing for the wisdom that would go forth from the restored Zion, and uh, which would e could equally well be described as our waiting for Torah. The assumption was that once Israel had fully realised its true role, purged by the suffering of exile, the nations would come to recognise its truth and its calling, Israel's truth and Israel's calling. <coughs> Neither James nor Paul disagreed with this position. Circumstances determined their different roles and perspectives, however. As a diaspora Jew and a man of two cultures, Paul's emphasis was on the larger Mediterranean world, and to his great surprise, the nations had responded in a way that Israel had not. As a result, he was left to agonise about the design and will of God when he faced this issue in his most considered work, the Epistle of the Romans, especially chapters 9 to 11. James, on the other hand, had to face the stark realities of the worsening political situation in Jerusalem in the period leading up to the First Revolt. Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, had been educated in Rome, was a friend of the new Emperor Caligula, under whose patronage he came to rule over a kingdom as large as that of his grandfather. Apart from his political astuteness, Agrippa also involved himself with Jewish religious affairs, to an extent that no other Herodian ruler had done. In particular, he exercised a right granted apparently by Rome uh, to appoint the high priest, and he was subsequently celebrated in Jewish tradition for his piety, actually taking part in the temple rituals. This presumably is the background to his attack on the Jesus movement in the city that led to the death of James, the son of Zebedee, and Peter arrested uh, and sent into exile, as we've mentioned already. In these circumstances, James, the brother of the Lord, was in a particularly vulnerable position, given the fact that his brother's crucifixion was a political, act by Ro uh, a political statement by Rome, intended to deter any would-be followers from con continuing with his revolt. In particular, Jesus' action in the temple seemed to have been the catalyst for his arrest and trial. Agrippa's direct involvement with the high priesthood and his efforts to avert a, ro a, revolt, uh, to avert a, role, a revolt because of the Emperor Caligula's desire to have a statue erected in the temple would have made James an easy and obvious target for he to step out of line. It says much for his astuteness to have survived for over 20 years in such a climate, it was 62 before he was put to death by Ananus. <clears throat> so, later tradition suggests that the Christian quarter in Jerusalem was located on Mount Zion, uh, one of the southern rises on which the, the city was built, 
and close to the Essene Gate. Perhaps, as Luke suggests, many priests joined the new movement, disaffected by the behaviour of the high priests and the apparent debasement of the office because of the frequent changes of personnel and the political chewing and froing that went on among the elites, as reported by Josephus. We also hear from him of the impoverishment of the country priests, as the servants of the high priests went to the villages to collect the tithes by violence if necessary. This would explain the profile of the Jerusalem community as an impoverished group, would also perhaps explain the group's more law-observant leanings than those of the original Galilean Jesus movement. While Agrippa died in the year 44, uh, thus initiating the second period of direct Roman rule of the whole of Palestine, the issues of high priesthood and temple continued to be at the centre of Judean polit political life right up to the revolt. A close reading of Josephus indicates that two quite different accusations were made against Ananus with, uh, with, with, with quite broader Im implications. Firstly, the opponents wrote to Agrippa II, the son of Agrippa I, who now had responsibility for overseeing the high priesthood, to the effect that James, the James incident was not the only occasion on which his nominee, Ananus, was guilty of breaking the law. And secondly, they met with Albinus, the new governor, pointing out that Ananus had no authority to convene a council of judges without his first consent. This might uh, appear to suggest that James was simply the, vi um, the victim of political infighting and corruption of the Jerusalem elite, as he was uh, 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 as much uh, uh, the victim as he was a, a religious martyr. Yet the fact that some others also suffered the same fate, and that his death led to the dispersal of the community to Pella, does indicate that the group of Jesus followers uh, were indeed targeted by the Jerusalem priestly authority at that point, James included. The road from martyr witness to martyr victim is a short one then, as now, when one dares to challenge imperial power and its retainers. I'd be glad to hear I've come to the conclusion of this rather long account. Uh, let me summarise it for you and my conclusions. The suggestion of seeing James and his followers within the framework provided by the Isaiah servant of Yahweh and his progeny, the servants of Zion, has proved to be helpful in linking both the themes which we have traced in the later, in the later legendary accounts back to the James of history. In view of the messianic status being attributed to Jesus, a continued attachment to Jerusalem as temple was important, indeed essential for the new movement, if its claims were to have any substance. It could well be that the obscure Semitic sounding name Oblias, which uh, is given to him by uh, Hegesippus, in an early is an early references to, uh, reference to James' symbolic role in that regard, with its possible derivation from Obadiah, namely the servant of Yahweh. Paul's designation of him as one of the pillar apostles had similar resonances associated with the temple. The precise circumstances that led to James' emergence as the leader of the group of Jesus' followers are hidden from view. But to my mind, the suggestion that the idea of blood brothers sharing the leadership in Israel following the pattern of Moses and Aaron has considerable merit. It would provide a background for the development of James' priestly character as seen in Hegesippus' account, as well as explain the presentation of Jesus as a prophet like Moses, rather than the, the Davidic Messiah in Jewish Christian circles. So James takes on a Neron kind of uh, role then, and his association with the temple would ha have those associations. Yet overt criticism of the existing temple and its personnel, so prevalent in other dissident strands of Judaism, even that of Jesus himself, is absent, other than the emphasis on prayer rather than sacrifice. However, the destruction of the temple following so closely on James's violent death prepared the way for the development of the martyrdom legend and the elaboration of James as an ascetic sadiq. The image of the suffering servant unjustly treated but vindicated by God was a prototype for all such stories of the suffering just ones. If his wisdom had served his leadership role well in life, James's martyrdom had enhanced it dramatically in his death. James and Jesus share the same fate and are rewarded by participating in the life of the one who is, as the second apocalypse of James expresses their, their coming together at last. The title for this paper speaks of retrieving James. But retrieval does not necessarily mean replication of every aspect of his life. Rather, it poses the more daunting challenge of addressing the question of the meaning or otherwise of James's life and legend now. Those modern Messianic Jews and Hebrew Christians who have sought to imitate the observant lifestyle of James and his Jewish Christian devotees have for the most part suffered the same fate as did their antecedents in the ancient times. That are being ignored or dismissed by the two blocks which we loosely described as, describe as mainline Jews. Speaking for many on both sides of the great divide of the late 4th century, uh, Jerem wrote, 
they, that is the Jewish Christians, seek to be both Jews and Christians, but they are neither Jew nor Christian. They seek to be both Jews and Christians, but they are neither Jews nor Christians. By the time of Eusebius, both official Judaism and official Christianity had developed strategies of dealing with each other in mutually hostile ways. The Christians claimed that they alone were the true Israel, and the Jews could dismiss them as deviant heretics. It suited both sides not to have to acknowledge that their rea reality on the ground was very different, and that in fact there, were, there was interaction across the Great Dividing Line in many situations. From the upper market in Sepphoris, where Rabbi Eliezer agreed with Yaakov of Kefir Sekania, a follower of Yeshua HaNazri, follower of the Jesus of Nazareth, to the synagogues of Antioch, frequented by Christians as, late, uh, Christians as late as the period of John Chrysostom in the 5th century. Neither of the main players wanted to recognise this, this in-between space occupied by the Jewish Christians. Perhaps what the story of James can tell us is the intolerance of power, particularly religious power, and the need to co-opt or demonise the other, whose very existence challenges, challenges the ideologies on which that power depends. This is particularly the case if that other is very near, so near indeed as to claim to be an insider. James and the Jewish Christians were anom 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 anomalous uh, to both great traditions because they bridged the gap between them. And certainly by the fourth century, neither wanted that to happen. One of the possibilities for a centre such as the James Centre here must surely be that of ensuring that there should be no place for such standoffs in our increasingly globalised but also secularised world. And that whenever discussions take place, the Jewish Christians should also be at the table. The repressed story of James and of Jewish Christianity in general has much to tell us about our past, but also about our present and our future. What a be better place for such a, re a, renewal of a, a, a re renewed conversation to begin than here in Bard. The story of our times may well be the beginnings of serious conversation between Jews and Christians, which has been put, in, put on a new footing by the Rabbi and the Pope. Thank you very much. As cards are making their way to me, I'll exercise the privilege of the chair and ask a question, if I may. First of all, prefacing it with my appreciation for the way in which you have treated the accounts of the death of James as a martyrdom. Uh, there has been a tendency to see it as separate from that tradition which came into full force during the second century. But I think you've been able to show how there are definite motifs of a typical martyrdom within the portrayal of James. He is innocent, he is interrogated, he is looking beyond the temple in the way that even the Maccabean martyrs did. And he is being faithful to the law. It raises the issue whether perhaps rather too much has been made of the issue of law in the study of James. But it also raises the question, what in your judgment precisely James was doing in the temple in order astutely to survive and yet at the same time to be recognized in association with Jesus? Thank you. I certainly asked myself that question and I'm not sure that I have the right answer. But I certainly don't think for a moment that he was doing what Hegesippus says he was doing, namely to enter the holy place. Uh, I think that Hegesippus lets it, lets it be, he wants to kind of portray him in such a, such a light clearly and uh, therefore describes him as being dressed in the, in the clothing of the high priest uh, pro appropriate for the Day of Atonement. But then let's slip, if you like, that he's praying constantly in the temple for the sins of the people, the Nas. So I think that perhaps it would be say, fair to say that James did frequent the temple, uh, like the early Christians are also presented uh, as having done, and uh, that uh, th this is now being seen within that kind of larger perspective of James as a Jew. Uh, somewhat, I suppose, a bit like what we might think of, um, of the story of um, Jesus, the son of Hananiah, that is told by Josephus, uh, talking about the, uh, the, da the danger and the threat to the temple, and uh, that this would probably have given rise to, uh, to, to uh, uh, perhaps taking notice of him. So James wasn't the only martyr, if you will, at that moment in time, who. Uh, uh, talked about the threat to Jerusalem. 
And uh, I think the story of Rad Rabbi Sadok, well, it is later a rabbinic story, of course, but uh, it, it does illustrate nonetheless how, how, how embedded in the tradition, if you like, that, that idea is of the just man who could save the temple if only they were, were listened to. Thank you very much indeed. I have my first question here from Al Wasserum. Thank you, Al. Which is, what would then be the relationship between James, Yaakov, and the Ebionites, in your judgment? <clears throat> Well, I, 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 it's very difficult to know, really. I think that um, I, I, it seems to me that that the fragments we have of the Ebionite tradition uh, does seem to suggest that uh, that they ha had certain difficulties around the question of Jesus' birth and so on. Uh, so that I, I, I think that Hegesippus thinks of them uh, certainly as, as heretical rather than the, and the Nazarenes as being more orthodox. But I think that, you see, this is, I'm using those large strands, if you like, Gnosticism, uh, Gnostic, uh, Jewish Christianity, and the main church, without for a moment wanting to suggest that these streams themselves didn't have very different currents within them. And it was only, it's only for the sake of systematization, if you like, I see these as three broad strands that we can identify. So it would seem that even within the Jewish uh, Christianity group, some of them come closer to the Gnosticizing group. And there's evidence of that as well. So it, it's, it's difficult, I think, to, to, to exactly uh, tease that one out. And I'm not quite sure how I would want to take it. But, but it's a good question, and I'd certainly like to be able to do it. Thank you for that. If I could follow up on sure. the question slightly, the particular issue of the evening-eyed view of Jesus' birth, yes. that is, in which he is a natural child yes. of his parents, yes. would that have anything to do with James, on your view? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, somebody said yes. <laughs> somebody answered for me here. <laughs> um, well, uh, Bruce, I know you're not putting me on the spot here, of course. Well, I do that. <laughs> uh, uh, certainly not. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't expect you to do that. You're too much of a gentleman. But uh, <clears throat> I think the proto-Vangelium of James is an attempt already to get us out of that problem by the idea of the story being, I didn't, I didn't go into that text actually, if I, if I just stayed with the, the one question of the identity of Jesus, I perhaps would have wanted to, go, to move more in that direction. But I wanted to kind of paint a broad sweep, if you will, of the, the question about James's authority as well. But I think the proto Evangelium of James tells the story of an attempt to, uh, to suggest, of course, that Mary was a temple virgin. At a certain stage of her life, uh, she had to be removed from the temple. She comes of age, puberty, age of puberty, and is given to a pious widow, uh, uh, widow James, or Joseph, rather, and James, uh, who had already a family, uh, and his brother is James, so James knows about this and so on. So that, that seems to me to be a story attempting to continue the idea that Jesus is indeed close to James, but at the same time that they, preserving the notion of the virgin birth, which had been developed in Matthew particularly, I suppose. Thank you very much for that. I knew that I was straying. No, no. And that you would be patient. I have a, a question that comes from uh, John, just, just John B., but I know that Frank Fonham will particularly like this question. What, if any, are the implications of this new research for the Catholic Church and the exaltation of Peter? Well, we like to ask easy questions. Especially, especially a good Roman. Like, good, did I explain that last time? Especially a good Roman Catholic like myself, you know, I, I really. <laughs> Uh, however, no, seriously, I think this is a very interesting question, of course, isn't it? And it does raise the question, of course, how the role of Peter came to be developed in the way that it did become developed in the early church already, and then subsequently, of course, in the, after the Constantinian period. And uh, I would have no hesitation, whatever, in saying that I think the Petrine office is an office within the church. He was leader of the Twelve and a very important leader within the church. But uh, whether or not it should have been developed in the, in the particular direction it has been, and the attempts, say, by Vatican II in particular to, to redress the balance by reducing, if you will, the, 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 the supremacy and the, the sole primacy of the Pope, uh, I think you know, it was laudable. Unfortunately, I don't think it has, it has quite achieved its... Um, its target or its, its objective in the post-conciliar period, but I happened to be a student in Rome in the days when the, those texts were being discussed with great insistence by various scholars, and uh, it was very exciting times. But unfortunately, I think that we've seen a kind of regression from that particular view. The idea was that, that now the, the, uh, the Pope uh, was, primus, was primus inter pares, so to speak, rather than, as it were, a sole official at the head of everything. And that was the attempt of, of at was, was called the collegiality of the bishops. But uh, I don't see that it has functioned in practice, uh, unfortunately.
And uh, I think that, that there is room for more discussion, particularly if we were to see two, two different sources, if you like, of authority within, from the beginning. One priestly and one prophetic, we might put it that way. If, I, if, if my linking of, of James and Jesus together as, as blood brothers like Aaron and Moses, which I thought was a very interesting suggestion, actually, made by a German scholar in 1936, no less. Uh, and I, when I came across in the footnote, I thought, this is very interesting, uh, Aaron and Moses. I had never thought of them as, uh, in, in that light before. So I think it would raise very interesting questions and maybe open up again the debate in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church in particular, of the role of Peter. And what is, what is the Petrine office? and how it relates to other centres of authority within the church. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, I'm not going to be medi cardinal for making statements like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Would that be the only uh, Well, there might be a few others as well, yes. <laughs> In view of your interfaith comments at the close, I think it's very useful that we have a question from Robert Cohen, who is a cantor from Kingston, and who is a colleague with me on the Episcopal Jewish Relations Committee for the Diocese of New York. Uh, he is one of our Jewish members along with Jacob Neusser. The question Robert asks is, what were the qualities that earned James the description as just? Uh, what are the qualities? <clears throat> Well, at the beginning of the legend, because it's much easier there, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? Um, he, he lived this ascetic lifestyle. Uh, and uh, that, that he's the chaos. But I think th then uh, when you put that whole idea of the as a type, the sadiq as a type in Judaism, uh, I think we can begin to see that he, the, the holy man is like the holy man. He's, he's, he's a center of power in his own way, he's a, a spiritual power, religious power. And that James was seen in that light uh, by his, his own followers. And uh, he, he becomes, in a way, it's, it's interesting that it's not the death of Jesus, as Origen and others had thought, that the, the fall of Jerusalem was attributed, attributed to the death of Jesus. Uh, for Hegesippus and the followers of James, it's the death of James that is responsible for that. that. The punishment of God comes in Jerusalem for the death of James, not the death of Jesus. So you can begin to see that very early on, I think uh, the followers of James are beginning to see in him qualities that are similar, if not equal to that, those of Jesus. They never call him the Christ, of course, but uh, I think calling him the, the priest is a very interesting way of developing the legend. Now, uh, what the historical James's role was uh, that gave rise to that is, of course, another question, and uh, I'm afraid I'm not fully privy to that, because, as I said already, he's, he's more or less written out of the script. But he does seem to be a wise man, I would say. Uh, you know, he, he knew when compromise was the best solution to an intractable problem. At least that's, even Luke is prepared to grant him that much. And uh, as I said, Luke doesn't really want him to play uh, an important influential role within the, this uh, chain of, of, of tradition that's developing. So I would, I would think that probably the notion of wisdom might play a role here. And it's interesting then, uh, I, some people, as I mentioned, I think in passing, just they didn't go into the Epistle of James, but uh, there's no question, I think, the Epistle of James does have a strong wisdom motif to it. And whether or not we can link that directly to the historical James, I think is doubtful, in my view. But nonetheless, again, a tradition that sees that, that tradition within early Christianity, not the apocalyptic tradition, but the wisdom tradition being carried forward in the James circle, might, I think, point us in the direction of James, at least. The historical James, I mean. If James himself had a leadership role, among followers of Jesus in Jerusalem in association with the temple. What kind of social authority would he have to have developed in order to succeed in that role? You mean social authority within the, the, the Jerusalem, the Jerusalem and within movement? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, it's, I think that within the movement is easier to explain, it seems to me. Uh, and I, I'm trying to imagine what would that little community have looked like inside the Zion Gate, or the Essene Gate rather, if, if that's where in fact they were located. So some people now say the Essene Gate wasn't really the Essene Gate at all. It was just the Essenes had camped outside the gate. But anyhow, uh, for now we can think about it in that way. And I walked around there and thought, tried to think about it a little more. I suppose we'd have to think about it as something like uh, we have a famous inscription from Jerusalem in the Temple period, that was called the famous Theodotus inscription, that talks about you know a, a place of lodging, but also a place of study and a place of prayer. And I, I suppose we'd have to think of something like that form, formula, but not excluding visits to the Temple. 
uh, you know. So I, 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 I think there would be in that kind of way. So he wouldn't, be, in other words, he wouldn't have had a high profile within Jerusalem as a whole, I think, it seems to me. Though obviously known to Ananus, clearly, and seen therefore as a threat in some way. I think if we take that as a historical given, that he was put to death in that period, and I think Josephus would have no reason to, to, to perhaps uh, not put, not, uh, to, to, to invent that story. Uh, maybe yeah, I did, but I think perhaps not. But uh, the, the fact that, that uh, he, uh, he come to the notice, if you like, of Jerusalem religious authorities uh, saw him as some sense of rival, I, th- I would have thought. And that that may have been the reason for his for his uh, removal, but um, uh, and not just his removal, but his followers' removal and some others. Josephus, but he doesn't tell us who they were. Of course, those some others get lost in the in the legendarization of James, and it's James alone becomes the martyr figure, which is interesting as well. I think it tells us a lot about about the hidden martyrs of our times sometimes, or the nameless ones. Thank you for that. I think that the answer, as well as your paper, helps me better to understand why. In the Epistle of James, James is identified as Dubos, yes. as slave or servant. Yes. Uh, that would help to explain his function of service within the temple. Yes. And at the same time, give it an authority and a low profile at one and the same time. At one and the same time. Yeah. Well, uh, 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 one is obviously guessing here, but I suppose one has to cri- guess critically, at least, you know, of oneself and try to try to think of possible alternative roles or uh, positions for him. That would seem to me to be the best analogue, again, I would call it, the Theodore's inscription, mm-hmm. because it gives us a, 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 an insider view of what a synagogue community looked like in Jerusalem in that period. And, and I, th- I would take it that the James group wouldn't have thought of themselves much differently. You mentioned the Essene Gate, mm. as may or may not be. Yes. And uh, that brings us to Kathy Friedman's question, which is, into which camp did the Essenes fit? Mm. And I think this is meant in terms of the relationship to Jesus' movement, James in particular, and also within Jerusalem. Yes. Well, <clears throat> uh, I, I suppose, again, the Essene movement is, is one that is up for revision at the moment <laughs> as well. And, and not being a Dead Sea Scroll scholar, I have to kind of listen to what I'm hearing. Uh, but uh, I think the, um, I, I, in a strange way, I see, I see Jesus himself as, as, as being a disciple of John the Baptist. And therefore, I think, having uh, some links with an Essene-like movement. If others can talk of a cynic like Jesus, I can talk of a scene like Jesus with, with greater, uh, I, think, I think, possibility of, uh, of, of um, uh, some, some virtue in that claim. Uh, but um, I, I, so I, the reason I say that, by the way, is uh, I, I think that the prophet Isaiah played a big role in, for the Essenes. We have, I think, it's something like eight or nine uh, manuscripts of Isaiah, one complete manuscript, uh, and uh, that these, um, uh, that clearly Isaiah was studied and written and so on in, in among the Essenes. And of course, the famous text in the in the desert, prepare uh, the way of the Lord, is used of Jesus, uh, or sorry, of John the Baptist, and also used of the teacher of righteousness. So I think there are kind of links there. Again, it depends how 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 much you define the Essene movement. Are there two types of Essene movement? The monastic movement in the desert. Are there a scene movement? Uh, is there a scene movement to be found also in villages? Uh, so, like people have argued, for example, that Bethany, Beth, Bethany, Bethany, the, the 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 house of the poor one, uh, it might be a, an Essene settlement of some kind, with kind of a, offering houses of. Um, uh, for pilgrims coming to the city and so on, lodgings for people coming on pilgrimage to the city. So, uh, the, the, as I said, the profile of these scenes is changing somewhat, and in a, in a sense it would be difficult to... to, to uh, but theologically, I suppose, we'd have to say that the Essenes uh, ha- have that more apocalyptic... As, as regard the temple, the temple scroll tells us clearly that they, they're expecting a temple, a new temple. Uh, James doesn't seem to be troubled about the temple or its existence. Uh, and that, that I find very interesting. That the Jewish Christians don't challenge, the, the challenge of sacrifice I find more difficult to explain, but certainly the fact that I think that has goes back to Isaiah again, where Isaiah says, My house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus is only citing Isaiah when he makes th- those kind of claims. But, and then the mention of James, of course, as a vegetarian, some have suggested might also be that he was anti sacrifice, anti animal sacrifice, which is perhaps a modern version on that, I'm not sure, but uh, it, it is at least interesting that, uh, he never, that he never ate any meat according to Hegesippus. Uh, 
but that may be rather because he has, at that stage this this trend of anti sacrifice had been developed in in, in the um, in the Jewish Christian among the Jewish Christians. But these are all the kind of questions. That where a kind of broader a broader picturing of, of the whole James phenomenon seems to me to be the better way, to, the only way to go. We can't keep on otherwise tossing the, the evidence around and um, trying to make a lot out of a little. Uh, but I think we do at least create a larger uh, framework. Uh, that we can put in place, uh, both in terms of different types of Judaism and uh, different strands within early Christianity, I think we're beginning to at least then be able to judge the probabilities or otherwise of our various hypotheses about James and his, his original historical role within early Christianity. That, I think, would be my, my, my kind of methodological moves as I would try to locate James. Thank you. I have a characteristically bracing question from Yvonne Lutherov, which is, you spoke a lot about the historical side of the James puzzle, but what is its theological side? What has been James' influence on early Christian theology, parenthesis to add to the challenge, apart from the question of the admission of Gentiles in the mm -hmm. church? Well, uh, uh, Again, I, I, I have to say, of course, the way that James is kind of co-opted into the different strands of Christian theology, as I've been outlining them, the Jewish Christian strand, the, the Gnostic strand, and the, and the, uh, the, the great church strand. <coughs> I think that, <coughs> I would think that perhaps as a Jewish Christian, uh, James would have been more comfortable, perhaps, with uh, uh, the prophet like Moses figure, uh, in terms of messianic, understanding of Jesus' messianic role or claim messianic role, I think that, that would be an important uh, side to him, not the Davidic. The Davidic uh, idea doesn't seem to play a role here in the way that the, that, the, um, um, that the prophet like Moses figure. That would be an important contribution, I think, uh, for our thinking about, about, um, about uh, Jesus himself also, and of course about, uh, about our relationship uh, with, with, their, with uh, Judaism in the period. Uh, what other theological ideas would I think about? Well, obviously, I think uh, the other would be what sense in which uh, um, a different kind of ecclesiological structures might be put in place. Uh, I've been reading uh, the very interesting debate, which I alluded to at the end of my paper, between uh, Pope Benedict and uh, Professor Neusner, and I thought it was a very interesting discussion uh, about the whole idea. Uh, Professor Neusner sees the the the, the um, th that. Uh, Jesus movement in particular, uh, as uh, Jesus himself in particular, as challenging this what he calls the social fabric of Jewish life, this, the 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 the, uh, the Sabbath and uh, the whole rituals associated with with the food laws and so on, the whole way of life that had developed as a Jewish way of life, and and uh, the Pope is trying to kind of respond to that by saying, well, yeah, but we brought back a social life later, uh, and uh, Christianity developed its own social life. Uh, I think it would be better, I thought that was a rather defensive move, I have to say so on behalf of Cardinal Ratzinger, or Bishop, the, the Pope. I, I, I think that it would be much better if we could say that uh, the early Christians perhaps uh, could have, but didn't perhaps develop and continue the social life that Judaism had developed and was developing post-Temple, the destruction of the Temple. That, 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 you know, for me personally, uh, my appreciation and understanding of Judaism uh, was extraordinarily, uh, I have to say, uh, enlightened by when I first read J Jacob Nelson's book, uh, Judaism, the Evidence of Mishnah, 20, 25 years ago, whenever it was published. And uh, it, it suddenly helped me to see that uh, I, I still have a, a phrase from that I, I, I drummed into my students. Um, uh, on the, 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 uh, the, the program of the priests. Um, uh, produced, developed by scribes for uh, the householder and the village. Uh, I think that's the way he summed up, if you like, the whole uh, achievement, if you like, of the, of the development of the Mishnaic system. If I'm, if I'm correct, I think that, that was it. And I, I thought that was extraordinarily interesting, and I, I alluded to this here in my paper then, that, that you see the temple is remembered in different ways. And the temple rituals are remembered in different ways in uh, different strands of Judaism. I think the artistic strand as well is quite interesting to see that that emerging as well. So I think that there would be many different ways in which the retrieval of James, uh, the James and the James tradition, if I might put it that way, would have interesting uh, impact on the way in which um, which uh, our, our ecclesial practice, if I might put it that way, might might uh, might be developed differently. Thank you for that. There are quite a few more questions, but I think I should probably make this last one and 
also invite Professor Frain, if he likes, to extend comments by way of conclusion to okay. the, the question okay. section, sure. uh, if you like. It's one which introduces a, a note of division into the inclusive comments you, you just made. Mm. When Anne uh, Gillen, who's a local uh, editor of journalist, asked, uh, how did James come to see his brother as the son of man? Very good question. Again, I wish I had the answers, but let me speculate. <laughs> um, I think, uh, actually, the Hegesippus quotation, uh, there that, where that is said, that he confesses he's the son of man sitting at the right hand and so on, I think that is one place where this kind of martyrological tradition is building up already. Stephen had said that. And I think it probably, you know, uh, in, in Acts 7. So it's, I think it's a case where, uh, you know, the, 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 the colouring and the echoing of, of previous stories is beginning to develop. So I think, uh, I, I, in that sense, I would see, see it as, a bar, uh, as part of that midrashic development, I would call it, where there's this kind of collapsing of the temporal distance of those first martyrs with James's martyrdom. I think that's something that Boyarin has brought out in his book about martyrdom and the whole Midrashic tradition, the, the kind of ellipse of time, or erasure of time, if you like, in the way in which uh, one story uh, prepares for another story, and, and in a sense is, is, is the other story, in a way. Uh, but I, again, I, I defer to people who know much more about Midrash than I do, but I, I found that very interesting uh, when I was reading uh, Boyarin's book on martyrdom, uh, which I tried to kind of introduce into the background to this, uh, to this treatment. Uh, the the uh, question of, of sorry, just to remind me, the question again exactly is formulated. Um, uh, how did uh, James come to see his brother as the son of man? Yes, as the son of man. Yeah, you see, <laughs> I could be clever, of course, and say Gaz Gazer Ramesher, and say son of man only meant um, you know this fellow, this bloke here, you know. But I don't think I'm going to play that route. I don't think James <laughs> meant. Uh, certainly, Hegesippus doesn't mean that. He uh, he's talking rather about seated at the right hand, so in power. So there's, a, there's an allusion to Daniel. Well, I could I could speculate differently. Let's. This is the kind of game of dialectic that I think we can do. Let's let's play a game here. Uh, uh, if if my hunch is right that the the Ebed Yahweh group, the Ebedim Yahweh, the, the servants of Yahweh group, uh, provide an analog not just for the Jesus movement uh, but also for the masculine at the time of Daniel. I think we we'd have a fairly clear connection there with the Daniel figure. And Daniel is being exalted, of course, and uh, uh, seeing the Son of Man, having the vision of the Son of Man. Daniel, because he was a wise man, because he was a pious man, because he was an observant man, everything that James was. So I think we could make interesting links between Daniel and James then, you see? As well. It's interesting if you look at the book of Daniel, which is a very composite book, I think most scholars would say. The first part of it gives us Daniel as being a very pious, good Jew, even in exile, even in, in Babylon, so I'm uh, careful to, uh, to observe the food laws and all the rest of it. But then, of course, the second half of the book, Daniel now becomes a recipient of special revelations, a special, uh, and we can't dismiss, I suppose, I, I, I'm not in any position to tell what a post-resurrection appearance is like, but I, I cannot dismiss, nonetheless, what Paul tells us, that, uh, that uh, James had a, uh, had a vision too of the risen Christ uh, as part of the very early statement of the Kerygma. I handed on to you what I myself received, that uh, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was seen uh, uh, by, the, by Peter and the Twelve and then so on, so on, and last of all seen by me. Now there he's talking, Paul is saying, I handed on what I received. In other words, there's a tradition already uh, within the early church for this kind of development of, of, of this tradition. So. Um, as I say, I'm in no position to say what a, I have not having had one myself. Uh, I'm in no position to say what a, a resurrection experience might be like. But I take it if I had one, I would certainly think take my second thoughts about who this person was and what his role was. So you know, we can play around in, with not play around. I'm not saying that in any any uh, cheap or easy way. But I think we can we can begin to ask and let our imagination work critically, critically on the different possibilities and see. You know, again, it's a question whether the framework I'm suggesting. Uh, play, is helpful in, in putting together the fragments. Because that's what I see myself doing in a way. Here I, I use that image at the beginning, uh, taking the fragments of a, a scroll or a script and putting them together, and when it's frayed at the edges, supplying. So that's what I'm trying to do, and hopefully not reading too much into the story at the same time. So.
left for me only to thank Professor Frame very deeply for his suggestions. It is a powerful new way of looking at Jenkins through the servants' tradition in Isaiah, which I think scholarship will be considering for some years to come. I might add that I give my apologies to people who have sent in their questions by email. When machines of this kind look at me, they freeze. And it is done precisely that. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.